amazing to think this miracle of the Holy Eucharist, that our Lord is present whole and entire in every one of those hosts. And back when we were having mass in the gymnasium for our temporary chapel a couple years ago, it would happen on occasion that the altar boys wouldn't have the right count, not necessarily their fault, maybe some people came in later. So the priest run, there's not enough hosts for all the people that want to receive communion. So what does a priest do? He breaks the host in two. And then each person receives not just part of communion, each person receives our Lord whole and entire, even if the priest has to break a host in two. So our Lord isn't divided. He's one, and he can no longer be divided. So you think about that every day throughout the world, especially every Sunday. How many Catholics are receiving Holy Communion all over the world on Sunday? You know, thousands and thousands. And yet, and there's only one Jesus Christ, and yet each one is receiving our Lord whole and entire. So you receive the body and the blood, even though you receive only under the appearances of bread. So then people ask that question. Well, then why? Why is that? Why do the, the faithful not receive under the appearances of wine, take from the chalice. Well, the reason for that, because that was done in the early church, but the reason was the danger of, of spilling, or the danger of the Blessed Sacrament being, uh, I don't want to use the word desecrated, but, but uh, irreverent, shown to the Blessed Sacrament by the danger of spilling. However, if you have gone, as I did some 50 years ago, when we were going to the Byzantine Mass for a while, so those of you who did that, uh, you're familiar, they take a golden spoon, and you go up for communion, you tilt your head way back and just open your mouth, you know, put your tongue out, and the priest drops the um, Blessed Sacrament, which is the bread, which they don't have unleavened bread, which means no yeast, it's all flat, what we have, they have, like, you take a slice of bread and cut it into squares. They have these little squares of leavened bread that they consecrate. And that's dropped into the chalice, and then that's... So you're receiving under those species in the Eastern rites of the church. But in the Latin rite, it has been the custom for about a thousand years, only under the appearances of bread, in order to avoid any danger of spilling or um, desecration of the blessed sacrament. Okay, um, we know that our Lord instituted the Holy Eucharist on the night of his Last Supper when he said to the apostles, he took bread, blessed it, and broke it, and gave it to them, said, take and eat, this is my body. And then he took the chalice of wine, and he blessed it, and said, take and drink, this is the chalice of my blood, of the new and eternal covenant, which shall be shed for you and for many unto the remission of sins. Now we have in your missal, you're following the, the words of consecration, the priest says, we have the words mystery of faith in there, but those were not in the Bible at least. That doesn't mean our Lord didn't say them. They're not found in the accounts. Now we have four accounts of the words of our Lord at the Last Supper, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and St. Paul in his uh, first epistle, first or second, I think it's the first epistle to the Corinthians. So three of the evangelists, St. John in his gospel does not give the words of consecration, the others do. Um, this was a big issue when the new mass first came out in the late 60s, 69, 70, because they changed the word many to all, which completely changes the meaning. And I'll mention that, what we mean by that briefly, the many signifies those who are saved. So I'm going to use the word salvation. And all signifies redemption. And apologists for the Novus Ordo would say to us, well, what are you trying to say? Are you trying to say that Christ didn't die for all men? And the answer to that is, of course not. We, he did die for all men, to redeem all men. But that's not, that does not mean that all men are saved. All, not all men are saved, all men were redeemed. Many are saved 
those who cooperate with the graces of the redemption are saved. And that's why in the, at the Last Supper, when our Lord gave us the form of the sacrament, he said, for you and for many, unto the remission of sins. Our Lord also said, well, let me just quote one of them here. Uh, this will be um, St. Matthew. Take and eat, this is my body. Then taking the cup, he gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, All of you drink of this, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is being shed for many unto the forgiveness of sins. Now, that word shed, that it's not just his blood, it's being shed for many, indicates that the Holy Eucharist, the, the idea of the sacrifice of the Mass, is very closely tied. Our Lord at the Last Supper, the night before he died and shed his blood, had very much in his mind that he was about to lay down his life for the redemption of men. So the we'll, we'll go into that again next week. We're going to cover the Mass. The idea of the death of our Lord on the cross, very much tied up with the Holy Eucharist, that idea. Okay, so the difference with many and all. But at the Last Supper, our Lord instituted the Eucharist. However, a year before, he promised that he would give his body and blood. And we find that in St. John's Gospel, chapter 6. And St. John's Gospel, chapter 6, is a very long chapter. Okay, you've got uh, a discourse for our Lord. Well, first of all, at the beginning of chapter 6, our Lord changes or multiplies takes five loaves and two fishes and blesses them and feeds a multitude of 5,000 people. Then he and the apostles went back across the lake, and the next day he was teaching in the synagogue at Capernaum. And he told the people, he said, you've come to hear me because you ate of the loaves and the, and the fishes in the desert were filled. In other words, you're like you're looking for another miracle. Mm -hmm. And then he said, he went on to say, the bread that I will give you is my flesh for the life of the world. I will give you. So this is a promise a year before. And in fact, if you read the whole discourse, he even goes so far as to say, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you shall not have life in you. He said, your fathers, your, I mean your forefathers, ate manna in the desert, but they have all died. But he who eats the bread that I will give will live forever. And many found this because it's repeated. If you read chapter 6, again, the long chapter, our Lord emphasizes it, repeats it. Uh, he, Unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you shall not have life in you. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood shall have everlasting life. I will raise him up on the last day, etc. Uh, he went on in detail about this. And many people left him. People even who were disciples or believed in our Lord, they, they said this is a hard saying, who can take it? And they left. And our Lord did not because of people leaving, he didn't say wait a minute, come back, you misunderstood me. I didn't really mean to eat my flesh and drink my blood. I did just symbolic. He didn't say that because he did mean what he said. And then he fulfilled it a year later at the Last Supper. But that's a good quote to use for Protestants who don't believe in the Holy Eucharist. They don't believe in the real, what we call the real presence of Christ in the Holy Eucharist. So our Lord is present in the tabernacles in our churches the same way he was present in the crib at Bethlehem, the same way he was present in the temple at the age of 12 when Mary and Joseph found him after three days and he was teaching the doctors in the temple or when he was walking the dusty roads of Judea and Galilee uh, at the age of 30, or 30 to 33. So the same Jesus Christ that was there is present in the tabernacles and received by the faithful in Holy Communion, although, of course, again, under the appearances of bread and wine. So we, again, that's a transubstantiation, but we use that terminology, the real presence of Christ in the Holy Eucharist. Okay, let me look through the catechism here to see some of the other information that I might not have covered. We're going to go on to 
the actual reception of our Lord, which we call, of course, Holy Communion. Okay. Um, what happened when our Lord said, this is my body, this is my blood, etc., the entire substance of the bread and wine changed into his body and blood. And then after he said that, he said to the apostles, do this in remembrance of me. So he was giving them the power, but also the command to do the same thing. Uh, let's see, did any of the bread and wine remain after the substances had been changed into our Lord's body and blood? And of course, you know the answer is no. There's no bread or wine left on the altar after the words of consecration. Uh, what do we mean by the appearances? Okay, I think we've gone through all of this. How was our Lord able to change bread and wine into his body and blood? He was able to do so by his almighty power. Obviously, he is God. He is divine. Um, does this change of bread and wine into the body and blood of Christ continue to be made in the church? And of course, you know the answer is yes, through the ministry of the priests. So our Lord said to the apostles, do this in remembrance of me. But that didn't mean just those apostles who were there. Because he also said, I am with you all days, even unto the consummation of the world. How is he with us? Well, especially in the Holy Eucharist. So he intended that this power should be passed down by the apostles to their successors, the bishops and priests in the church, until the end of time. Um, and then the last question here is what I mentioned at the beginning. Why? Why does Christ give us his own body and blood in the Holy Eucharist? He gives us his body and blood in the Holy Eucharist first to be offered as a sacrifice, commemorating and renewing for all time the sacrifice of the cross. And that's the part of the Holy Eucharist we'll talk about next week. Um, what we mean by the Mass, the definition of the Mass, what the Mass is, understanding of that. So the Mass renews for all time the death of our Lord on the cross, and of course you know that the Mass is the unbloody renewal of the sacrifice of Christ on the cross. So Christ gives us his body and blood in the Holy Eucharist first to be offered as a sacrifice, commemorating and renewing for all time the sacrifice of the cross. Second, to be received by the faithful in Holy Communion, which we will cover shortly. And third, to remain ever on our altars as the proof of his love for us and to be worshipped. So the idea of making visits to the Blessed Sacrament, or you come for Mass on Sunday or on a weekday, and you're there early, ahead of time, to spend time with our Lord in the Blessed Sacrament, to speak with Him, to adore Him, to ask for the graces you need. And we'll talk about, with communion, not being so anxious to leave after Mass is over, making a good Thanksgiving. So, let us go into Holy Communion. So Holy Communion is the name we have for the act of receiving the body and blood of Christ as your food and drink. What is necessary to receive Holy Communion worthily? I'll just give you the substance of that answer. Three things. So, to receive our Lord worthily, we must first and foremost be in the state of grace. Second, we must observe the proper fast. go into that as well, but out of reverence for the body and blood of Christ. And third, we must have a right intention. So I tell children when we go through that with children, that means you're not going to communion because your parents want you to go, or you're not going because your friends are going, you're going because you love our Lord, you want to please him, you want his help, you want to be united with him, you want his grace. There's a lot of right intentions, but it means we don't have a bad intention, which would be like someone will just because everyone else is going to communion, etc. So those are the three uh, conditions for receiving our Lord worthily. Now, as you know, we have the tremendous privilege of going to communion every single day. If you're able to go to a daily mass, you can receive communion every day. As often as you wish, except not twice on the same day. 
The only time you could receive Holy Communion a second time on the same day would be danger of death. So like you receive communion in the morning and something happens, you're in danger of death later that day, you could receive communion again. And the other reason would be to save the Blessed Sacrament from desecration. But otherwise, you cannot, and in, in the modern church, they began to allow this in the 60s, and that was if you went to a midnight mass on Christmas or Easter, and then you went home, went to bed, got some sleep, and went back to the church for a mass during the day, that you could receive communion again. No, that was not a traditional practice of the church. So midnight to midnight. So communion only at most once a day. Um, but what a privilege to be able to go to Holy Communion as often as we wish. This is the sacrament, hands down, this is the sacrament that is received most frequently by the faithful. Of course, the other sacrament we receive often in our lifetimes is the sacrament of penance, but I'm sure not as often as Holy Communion. All right. Uh, does he who knowingly receives Holy Communion in mortal sin receive the body and blood of Christ? Yes, he does. But he commits the grave sin of sacrament. But he does receive the body and the blood of Christ. You know, it's interesting. There have been, down through the centuries, there have been many Eucharistic miracles of uh, host bleeding or things of that nature as a testimony that our Lord is truly present there. So even if someone receives unworthily, he's still receiving the body and blood of Christ because once the bread and wine have been consecrated, changed into the body and blood of Christ, they remain until they dissolve. And so like when you receive Holy Communion, you receive the host, you swallow the host, eventually your stomach enzymes will break it down so that it's no longer the appearances of bread, and then it no longer is the body of blood of Christ either. He is no longer physically there. And theologians say that that's probably about 15 minutes from the time you receive Communion. Now another important thing about, and I'm kind of bouncing around as I, as I think of points on Communion, Another point to be mentioned is that you not allow the host to simply dissolve in your mouth. So when we receive communion, we typically will allow the host to be uh, wet with saliva on both sides, maybe turn it over using your tongue, uh, and let it shrink a little bit to the point where you, sometimes it'll break in half, to the point where you're able to, to swallow it, but you swallow the host as soon as you're able. Because if you allowed it to just completely dissolve in your tongue, in your mouth, that you would not be receiving Holy Communion. Because our Lord said, take and eat. And eating is swallowing the food into your stomach so that your body can use the nutrients. So we, um, we want to make sure you don't, you're not going to get the graces of Communion if it just dissolves in the mouth. But here's an interesting thing that St. Thomas Aquinas points out about the Eucharist. Normal food, you eat it, and you change it into you. So you eat a sandwich, and elements of that food become cells in your body, because our body is constantly replicating, you know, your new cells, etc. And of course, some of that food is turns into energy, where you get your energy, and the rest is expelled by the but you're taking food in, and you change it into you. But when we receive communion, our Lord changes us into him. It's a, it's a wonderful thought, the difference between this food, besides the fact that this is our Lord himself. But the more we receive Holy Communion worthily, the more our Lord changes us into himself. We become more and more Christ-like. Uh, so before Pope Pius XII, change the communion fast, you had to fast from midnight. Mm -hmm. Now I mentioned Pope St. Pius X, we owe him the wonderful gift, the wonderful blessing that we were able to receive communion as children early. Children receive communion. And how many communions does a child receive who makes his first communion at seven or eight years old? up until the child is 12. And you think all of those communions that child would not have been able to make before the time of Pius X, um, who was Pope in 1903 to 1914. 
Um, the other pope that comes into play here is Pope Pius XII, who died in 1958. He mitigated the communion fast. Now, the communion fast was so strict that you could not take in anything by mouth after midnight of the day on which you received communion. So that meant not only no food, you couldn't even drink water. Now imagine a priest in the summertime in the hot weather and hot and humid weather uh, in our country in the summertime having three masses on Sunday, no water in between, so he would not purify the chalice because he couldn't consume anything after consuming the, the, chalice, the precious blood. Pope Pius XII was here in this country as a cardinal in 1936. He was elected pope three years later, 1939. But we had this old priest at the mouth, and he, he claimed that he was partly responsible for that <laughs> because Pope Pius XII, as a cardinal, traveled around the United States. And when he was in, I think this priest was in Milwaukee, when he was in Wisconsin, he had a chance to meet Cardinal Pacelli. And he started talking to him about this. He says, you know, you Italians, you maybe have one mass on Sunday because you have so many priests. But here in the United States, we parish priests, we have a, a large number of masses on Sunday, and it's very difficult. Um, one priest, I think it was Father Clement Kubish, told me that when he was done with all of his masses on Sunday, he would sit down and drink a gallon of water. That's just what he told me. And I said, I said, sure, a gallon? He said, yeah. he said I'm serious. Now, I'm not like chugging it, but I'm you know, drinking a little bit. A little bit later, having another half a cup, he would drink a gallon of water on some, in the summertime because he would be just so dehydrated. Um, so that was, I'm talking about priests, but then about the laity. You couldn't receive communion. I read an autobiography of a priest, and he said that he, he only missed Mass twice in his life. And he wrote this when, after he'd been a priest for 60 years or so late in his life. And he said, I missed Mass twice. I don't remember the second one, but the first one was right after World War II. He was involved as a chaplain for young couples, the vets that would come back from the military and uh, counseling them. And they'd get married, et cetera, and work with these young soldiers that returned and their families. And he often went when the wife was going to have her first baby, he was there at the hospital pacing the hallway with the nervous husband. Um, and he went by a drinking water fountain and just, without thinking, had a drink. And it hit him right away, and he looked at his watch a few minutes after midnight. He could not have mass that day. It was a few minutes after midnight. And he didn't think of it until, um, you know, until after he had drunk the water. Just a few sips. Couldn't have to eat. So, Pope Pius XII mitigated the communion fast in 1953, and then he made further clarifications and, and mitigations in 1957. So I'll read to you the current, you know this, the current law of the church since that time, Pius XII, uh, regarding the communion fast. Number one. Water may be taken at any time before Holy Communion without breaking the fast. Number two, and this is something that a lot of people aren't aware of, sick persons, even if not confined to bed, may receive Holy Communion after taking medicine or non-alcoholic drinks. A priest's permission is not necessary. So a person who is truly ill, even if not bedridden, could receive communion even after uh, drinking some apple juice. You know, five minutes later, whatever, could receive communion, could. Because sometimes maybe to take their medicine, they needed to, to drink milk with it or, you know, some, uh, some liquid. So a sick person, there's no, the rest of us, it's one hour for non-alcoholic drinks. And we talked about, I think this came up last week, we were talking about it, the Lenten fast, you can't have like a shake. You know, you can't have a thick liquid that's that's more nourishment, more like a meal, a protein shake. But you could an hour before Holy Communion because 
all liquids that are non-alcoholic are permitted at, at, up to an hour before communion. Uh, and then, of course, solid food be three hours. Now, you, lay people, and sisters, you can time your fast up until the time of you, rec of you receive Holy Communion. A priest's fast is up to the time he starts Mass. So for us, it's going to be a little longer. That I could, I'm going to start Mass at a certain time. I have to be done with breakfast, you know, from the three hours from the time I'm going to start Mass. Um, and that three hours is to be exact. So uh, most theologians will say if it's within a minute, that's okay. But even if it's like one minute or two minutes, you can't go to communion. Sometimes I'll have, sometimes I'll have a server watching his watch, looking at his watch, and won't receive communion, and then will be able to receive communion by the time at the end of the distribution of communion because he's, his fast maybe was close. Because you've got to be exact. Yeah? It has to be a minimum of three hours fast. So once again, to repeat the rules for the fast before Holy Communion, number one, water may be taken at any time before Communion. Number two, sick persons, even though not confined to bed, may receive Holy Communion after taking medicine or non-alcoholic beverages, and a priest's permission is not required. Number three, all Catholics may receive Holy Communion after fasting three hours from food and alcoholic drinks, and one hour from non-alcoholic drinks. This applies to Holy Communion at midnight mass as well as at masses celebrated in the morning, afternoon, or evening. A priest's permission is not necessary. And number four, and this is important, Catholics are urged to observe the Eucharistic fast from midnight as before and also are to compensate for the use of the new privileges by works of charity and penance. But these practices are not obligatory. One who has already received Holy Communion may not receive the Blessed Sacrament again on the same day except in danger of death. So what is it saying here? You're urged. You go to a morning Mass and you're able to do so. Keep the fast from midnight as before. Now it's not obligatory, but it's recommended to follow that fast. Now, if you take advantage of this, you have a cup of coffee in the morning before you come to Mass, the Pope is urging that you do something else to satisfy for that mitigation, that privilege that you had of using that one hour fast for liquids, to have your cup of coffee before mass, an act of charity, a, a sacrifice, a penance. The Pope is encouraging that, not making it mandatory. Let me reread that last part, just to make sure there's no misunderstanding. Catholics are urged to observe the Eucharistic fast from midnight as formerly and also to compensate for the use of the new privileges by works of charity and penance. But these practices are not obligatory. Okay. So that is the Eucharistic fast as given us by Pope Pius XII. Now, how should we prepare for Holy Communion? We should prepare for Holy Communion by thinking of our Divine Redeemer, whom we are about to receive, and by making fervent acts of faith, hope, and charity and also contrition. So just before this class, we said the acts of faith, hope, and charity. That's a good thing to do, like during Mass, as you're attending Mass. On your way to Mass, to strive for recollection, to avoid just distraction and looking about and talking, etc., because you're going to be receiving communion, or at least when you are going to receive communion. You want to have a recollection beforehand. You want to be there ahead of time, not just to squeeze into church at the last second, right before the Mass begins. To be there to prepare yourself spiritually. Now there's a great book on the Mass, which we'll go into next Sunday mention it. But this book, uh, The Hidden Treasure, Holy Mass by St. Leonard of Fort Maurice. And then there are chapters on the Mass in books on the Holy Eucharist, such as the Blessed Eucharist by Father Michael Mueller. But these uh, writings on the Mass give you ideas for different ways of attending Mass. Because when you attend Mass, what are you supposed to do? You are supposed to mentally unite yourself with the priest who is offering our Lord so that he offers you together with our Lord. And you're offering yourself with our Lord. You're participating in that way in the Mass. So you're hearing Mass. You're following your Missal, 
or maybe praying a rosary, meditating on the passion, there are different things you can do to attend Mass devoutly, but we want to make certain that we attend Mass well. All right, so it says we should prepare ourselves for communion by thinking of our Divine Redeemer, whom we are about to receive by making fervent acts of faith, hope, charity, and contrition. Uh, what should we do after communion? Very important question. After Holy Communion, we should spend some time adoring our Lord, thanking Him, renewing our promises of love and of obedience to Him, and asking Him for blessings for ourselves and others. So in other words, you make a thanksgiving. You spend some time, you're not just so anxious to leave the church as soon as possible. Now I will grant that on a Sunday, I don't know how long it takes us here to distribute communion on a Sunday, but the point is someone who receives at the beginning of the group that go up for communion, when there's a large number present, by the time Mass is over, maybe has maybe it has been about 15 minutes. But spiritual writers recommend that use 15 minutes. So if you looked at your watch when you receive communion, and then Mass is over in what, seven minutes, eight minutes? And you spent another five, six, seven minutes of thanksgiving because you still have our Lord. So there's a story told by Father Mueller in his book on the Blessed Eucharist that the priest would notice out of the window in his sacristy this one man who would come and receive communion and would leave right away after receiving communion. And to get the point across, one day he told some altar boys to go out, one carrying the candle, one with the bell, one with the incense. Yeah. And they're walking along with this man, incensing him and holding the candle and ringing the bell. And he's very embarrassed by this. And he said, what are you doing this for? And they said, well, Father told us to honor the Blessed Sacrament in you that you have received, since you're not. He told us to give our Lord the honor that you're not giving him. And he got across the point. But how many of us would kind of fall under that? admonition at times. Um, forget about the value, the importance of Thanksgiving. And a good Thanksgiving is the best preparation for your next reception of Holy Communion. By thanking our Lord as he deserves, we merit, we deserve to receive future graces. Now, this is a very important question. What are the effects of Holy Communion? Each Sacrament, as you go through the catechism, will give you the result, the effect of receiving that sacrament devoutly. So what does the Holy Eucharist do for us? Number one, the first effect is a closer union with our Lord and a more fervent love of God and of our neighbor. Now, St. Thomas talks about this. He says there's many grains of wheat that are ground and make up the flour that make up the host, and many grapes that are crushed and make up the wine that are consecrated into the body and blood of Christ. So that idea of, of a number of grapes, a number of grains of, of wheat, and making one thing is the idea that we, many people with many different personalities, etc., the Holy Eucharist is to draw us closer together with our Lord. So to, to instill a union in the mystical body, uh, to strengthen the bonds of charity for one another, and of course, above all, for our Lord. Love for our Lord, love for one another. So that's a very important effect of communion. That's number one, to effect a closer union with our Lord and a more fervent love of God and our neighbor. Number two, an increase of sanctifying grace. Third, preservation from mortal sin and the remission of venial sin. What that means is if we stayed away from Holy Communion for a long period of time, it would not be possible for us to persevere in the state of grace. We would sooner or later fall into mortal sin, unless we were prevented from communion. But if it's, if it's purely of our own decision, we would find it very difficult to maintain the state of grace. So the third effect is preservation from mortal sin and the remission of venial sins and the reduction of venial sin. We find it strengthens us spiritually against temptations. And fourth, the lessening of our inclination to sin and the help to practice good works. So the third is, is helping us to avoid mortal sin and even venial sin and, and uh, remitting 
any venial sins or may be unsolved. And, set, and the next point is that it lessens the inclination to sin. So by receiving our Lord in Holy Communion devoutly every day, we could say that in a sense, properly understood, we are becoming divinized. We are becoming more and more like Christ. His life within us, flowing through our veins, strengthening, strengthening us in the practice of virtue. When are we obliged to receive Holy Communion? We're only obliged once a year during the Easter season, which, as you know, in the United States lasts from the first Sunday of Lent, which is usually around early March or maybe late February, up until Trinity Sunday, which is about three months later. So it's a fairly good stretch of time. That's called the Easter time. And Catholics are obliged, under pain of mortal sin, to receive Holy Communion during the Easter time. We also are obligated to receive Holy Communion in danger of death. And you know that Holy Communion in danger of death is that is given to someone in danger of death is called viaticum. And this via means your ro a road. And cum means with. And this word, viaticum, means, sometimes it's translated as food for a journey, but it is receiving the spiritual nourishment to strengthen us on that final journey of departing this world. So someone who's in danger of death, likewise, is obligated to receive Holy Communion, in addition to everyone during the Easter time. Two more questions. Why is it well to receive Holy Communion often, even daily? stands only to reason, but I'll read the answer. It is well to receive Holy Communion often, even daily, because this intimate union with Jesus Christ, the source of all holiness, and the giver of all graces, is the greatest aid to a holy life. There is nothing else that equals the value of a devout Holy Communion to help us to avoid sin, to practice virtue, to overcome our faults, and to persevere. And finally, how should we show our gratitude to our Lord for remaining always on our altars? We should show our gratitude to our Lord for remaining on our altars in the Holy Eucharist by visiting him often, by reverence in church, by assisting every day at Mass when this is possible, by attending parish devotions, and by, by being present at benediction of the Blessed Sacrament. So that's something to keep in mind. I erased it now, but the Three reasons our Lord is there to be offered in the Mass, to be received in Holy Communion, and to remain always on the altar in our tabernacles. And we should desire to be with our Lord, to make visits, to spend time with Him, and uh, again to be present for devotions and benediction, etc. All right, we'll, we'll continue with the Mass next uh, week. And I don't know if I missed anything on Holy Eucharist that we should cover. Any questions on that material? Let's have a blessing.
She's like, I'd like to be responsible for my actions. And then, and then she's like, she's like, like I would have a set up. I could be responsible for being set up. Yeah, for falling for it and going to the so rare that you can't find them in these stores mm -hmm. and everything. So that's why they're, they're charging and charging four times the amount. 
this should only be like a three hour class. But now it's like seven. Mm -hmm. How about training wheels? Oh, they do go up in prices. My mom has been buying pants and she's like carrying stuff in You walking. can't find them in any stores. Yeah. So luckily we have enough left over from last year that I'm able to like pay. Yeah, but like, can I stop at 200 quarts for fruit? <laughs> <laughs> well, you might be a lot of fruit. Yeah, so we're, like Saturday they're picking all the pears because I learned they were supposed to rip them off the tree because they're, the tree is just loaded. And then the plums are going to pick on Monday, which I'm going to stop at 200 quarts. And then. Just for plums? Yeah. Like just for plums. Do you guys go through all the people through? No, because. Honor won't allow them to add sugar to it. So when you can it without sugar, it's outrageously sour. So there's all the applesauce goes on there. Are we gonna eat it? Well not unless well the sisters eat the non sugar stuff. And I convinced father to say yes and then add sugar to the sugar stuff. Because it's like they put it out for a meal and the boys won't touch it. And I'm like, I don't blame them. It's so it's like really sour. I need a few for my lip.